Oscar Bevis, IFL TV, proudly sponsored by the last Eddie Hearn joins me. Ed, we've just had ceremonial weigh-ins, a um, few Irish in. Good laugh, really. Yeah, good good laugh, yeah. You had a good laugh. It was good, great atmosphere. It's going to be lively in there tomorrow night. And I like, you said, there's nothing like the travelling Irish. And Quigley looks great. <laughs> looks great, you know, but it's not a secret that Demetrius struggles to get down to 160, made it well, but it's always a struggle. And Quigley looks really healthy, strong, as you know. You know, the weigh-ins took place at nine o'clock this morning and the ceremonial weigh-in just took place. And I think he's going to give it everything. I think there'll be a great atmosphere in there tomorrow. I think we'll get a great fight. Yeah, the ceremonial weigh-in is a really interesting sort of thing because I said to you, I remember it from when I'd done my last US trip with, with Jake Paul. And is it something you, you look to bring over to the UK? Because just seeing the fighters... Did I drop something? Yeah. What have I dropped? Um, drop the name. Hey? You dropped the name down there. Oh. I can't believe I actually fell. I'm standing there looking. I've got like the deepest pockets as well. Yeah. Right. No, um, going no, back to the way. No, but yeah, no, like I see the fighters at breakfast and it's just weird because Demetrius is having like eggs and bacon yeah. on toast. And I'm it's, like, what? It's something that I feel like we should implement around the world. I think fighter safety is paramount. We all know that injuries can occur through fighters being dehydrated. So by weighing them in at nine o'clock, gives them four hours extra to rehydrate. You know, you get... Uh, a happier fighter, you get a healthier fighter, and you get someone that, that you know can potentially perform better on the night as well. And we have to keep evolving. It's not rocket science, and it's not difficult to do. And we started doing it maybe a year ago in the US, and you see, I think the fighters love it, and it just gives them a chance to prepare themselves for battle and for war, and it can save lives, I believe. And it can stop fighters getting injured. Um, and we should look to do that in the UK. I'm actually gonna to speak to Robert Smith about it, who, you know, again, it's not difficult to do. You can't, there is no reason why we shouldn't do it. And, and I, I'm not an expert, I'm not a doctor, but I believe you speak to any doctor in that, in that uh, department and they will tell you, of course, you know, the longer you get to rehydrate, the, the healthier you will be in the ring. And that's important to make sure that we give fighters every opportunity to be so. Yes, yeah, I always just presumed it was one o'clock in the UK because like, it suits TV, like when you were putting them on the Sky and it suits social yeah, media. It but why can't it just happen then? Is there like a sort of ruling that needs well, to be, you be passed? The, you can still do the weigh-in, you know, like today, one o'clock. And when you're in the UK, you can do it, you know, for the, for the live stream. You can do it to let people come for, on their lunch break. That's not a problem, but it doesn't have to be. People, you know, it doesn't really matter that whether you're weighing in. It's, it's a ceremonial weigh-in to flex up and have a last head-to-head. -head. But it's just safer. And we can't just neglect that. We can't just, you know, disregard that. If it's easier to do for the fighter, if it's safer for the fighter, we have to do it. And, and it's worked really well in America. And I think it's something we should look at. Yesterday, he was winding me up about trying to get a bird here in New Manchester. Yeah. I will say one thing, no success yet, but I'll say one thing. I need someone who looks at me the way you look at MJ. You and Akhmadali, I was just laughing my head off because I weren't filming the MJ way and I'm going to nick that from your stream. But... Uh, just you were just like so cheesy just that you love him don't you I love him I'm a fan yeah. but you love him don't you I love him and I love Julio Cesar Martinez as well I just love fighters they're exciting you know I mean and I love fighters that have no fear and will fight anybody and and sometimes when you come from Uzbekistan and you just come over to the US to, to you know ply your trade you have to take chances you have to fight people that you wouldn't normally fight he's had nine fights you know, in his seventh fight, he beat Daniel Roman for the Unified World Championship. And he'll fight anyone, Fulton, Figueroa. He'll go down to 118 and fight Inoue, honestly. And he's absolutely brilliant at Madlib. He's a pound-for-pound -pound great fighter. And I look at him and I just know that, you know, it's like when you know you've got something so good like at Madlib, you just go, this guy, I don't, think, I don't think there's anyone that can beat him around that division. So Inoue is a war and I'd, I'd love to see it, but at 122 pounds... No one beats him. So, you know, hopefully he wins tomorrow night and then you just go out and you talk about the winner of Figueroa and Fulton and say, let's do it undisputed. Because I know our guy wins. And that's really nice to know as a promoter. And Julio Cesar Martinez, I just love him. I think he's so exciting, so entertaining. And, you know, as a fighter, you have to entertain. If you don't entertain, people don't want to watch you. And as a promoter, when you've got a fighter that's so entertaining, again, they're gold. And, and those two are gold, and I do love them, you know. And, and even though neither of them speak English, we have good respect. And um, what does Martinez say? Uh, con miedo, ton con miedos, or something like that. It means it means with everything but fear.
and that's him. Comes from, you know, a brutal part of Mexico, mate. Brutal, and just tough kid. And he'll fight. You know, I mean, I just find it hilarious. You got a kid there who's like five foot. Was he five foot one, five foot two? And you know, he'd go through everybody in the room, me included. You know what I mean? He's an absolute brute, and I love him. Just a quick one. There was an um, article on Ring uh, about Martinez saying that he wants to fight Sonny Edwards. Sonny's been well ridiculously vocal about wanting um, to fight Martinez. Uh, I know you talk about him moving up and Estrada and whatnot, and they're, they're obviously banging fights. But from a UK perspective, him and Sonny is like that's gold. Yeah, it's a good fight. Sonny Edwards is a great fighter. You know, very tricky, very awkward to beat. Um, but any of the champions, literally, any, like he has to unify before he goes up because he's too good not to. Like it would be, a, it would be. I believe that Julio Cesar Martinez can unify the division at flyweight, win world titles at super flyweight, win world titles at bantamweight. But to not unify the division just seems like a bit of a waste because you'll never go back. But he can't make the weight forever. He made this one well, actually, but he just can't make it forever. But Sonny Edwards' fight, great fight. And, and you know, it's a, that's a tough fight as well. Hey, just your thoughts on Luis Ortiz and Charles Martin, um, Fox PBC pay-per-view, um, $40, yeah. Um, it's a bit of a strange one. I mean, look, everyone's got their reasons for doing stuff, and I don't know the reasons, but just a weird one. I don't like the idea of doing cheaper pay-per-views. It's either pay-per-view or it's not. And by doing a cheaper pay-per-view, what you're basically saying is, this isn't very good, so we've halved the price. But I don't know, like if that does 20,000 pay-per-view buys, I'd be astonished. It generates like $800,000. Or well, less to the actual show. Call it $500,000. I don't, I don't really see the point of just pissing off the audience and taking the mickey out of fight fans by doing that when you could just do it on a normal show. But maybe they've run out of shows. And this, this happens. You know, we, we've all got such huge stables, sometimes you can't fulfill. That's why our global platform is so important to us, because we can give fighters opportunity to fight in Milan, in Barcelona, in Guadalajara, in Australia, you know, all around the world. And I know how difficult it is to fulfill the obligations to a fighter. So if they've run out of dates, for example, and they don't have the money to spend on a show on January, they said, let's do it this way. And the proof will be in the pudding with the numbers. Just, just a bit strange, you know. I just think pay-per-view, and I think, like Crawford Porter, I think he's a great fighter, but I just think he's going to die on pay-per-view. You've just had Canelo Alvarez at 80 bucks, who's done a huge amount of buys. And now you've got this, and then next week you've got, or two weeks, you've got Tank against Isaac Cruz. It's not a pay-per-view fight. And then a couple of weeks after that, you've got Jake Paul against Tommy Fury. And then a couple of weeks after that, now you've got 39.99 of that. I just, for, for me, listen... The way that our business is structured with, with DAZN and the way that DAZN present value for money with subscribers, secretly I'm saying do more. Do more pay-per-views because it's just, you, you know that when you f saturate a market like that with, with, a, with a product that's not good enough and doesn't provide value for money, it's going to diminish over time and it is diminishing. And that's why I feel like we're really well placed. Yeah, I mean, it is a, sort of a really strange concept and you talk about I mean, the amount of times you've had long, in-depth conversations about pay-per-view and getting rid of pay-per-view, and then we had the DAZN sort of um, like teaser, almost a little feed-out, just to say what, what people would be interested in for pay-per-view. Just from your perspective, right, I can't liken it to two English heavyweights around that level, but if that was put out in England, what do you think the reaction would be? Let's go back to when you were with Sky Sports. I mean, every time we announced the pay-per-view, the reaction was terrible. But I stand by, like, those pay-per-views delivered value for money. But now we're bringing it a different kind of model. I mean, I keep, you know, looking at... Chisora Parker is a great example, right? Chisora Parker was pay-per-view five months ago. Trust me when I say Chisora Parker 2 was pay-per-view on Sky, right? I've been there for a long time. Trust me, that fight would have been. Now it's on... And that comes from a place not where you think it might be a pay-per-view fight, just the model and, and the financials. Yeah, but now we don't have to do that anymore. So now we're in a position where, you know, like if you subscribe to um, the zone tomorrow or whatever it is, you're going to get our card on Friday night for World Championship fights, Tiafimo against Cambosis, Haney against Diaz, Conor Ben Algieri, Katie Taylor, Robbie Davis Jr. against Lundy, Gurphy Gill, etc., and Chisora Parker for $7.99 versus paying $19.99 for Chisora Parker. So you have to look at that and say, that's brilliant for boxing, what the zone are doing. And... You know, for years and years, we couldn't put certain fights on because we didn't have the budget to do so on a Saturday night fight night. 
but now we do. So that's the plan moving forward, is to consistently do, and pay-per-view will always exist, and, and I don't have any problem with it, it should. AJ, always a pay-per-view fighter. And that's why you get stuff talked about to zone because they go into the AJ market now, and they have to be able to offer that functionality to get AJ on the UK platform. Tyson Fury against Dylan White, pay-per-view. No, there's no, it doesn't work any other way. But what we can do now is take the four or five fights a year that used to cost you £20 a night and make it part of a fantastic schedule on the zone. Does a pay-per-view also require characters? Because you talk about some of the fights, and like Crawford Porter at Welterweight is such a sick fight. It's one of the best fights in the division. But you're saying that's not pay-per-view. Do you think it requires sort of characters as well? So you've got the like of Usyk Fury. They're sort of they're big characters. So pay-per-view requires more than the fights. It requires a storyline sort of thing. Oscar, pay-per-view probably relies on personality and charisma sometimes more than even the fight because the hardcore audience is not the driver to big pay-per-view numbers. It's about bringing, you know, when you look at DAZN now, every fight fan has DAZN in the UK. Every hardcore, dedicated fight fan, we see it from the numbers, they have DAZN. The key is to reach out to the casual market, and you do that via personalities, via storylines, via characters. Um, and Crawford Porter is a victim of that, because that is actually a really good fight, but two guys and Tim Bradley said it yesterday and he's you know this is not the way to sell pay-per-view they're up there good luck mate shaking hands it doesn't sell you know I saw that with you know, Lomachenko Campbell you know when, when you've got Chisora Parker doing 50% or actually more than Lomachenko against Campbell that that shows you one it's the Del Boy factor it, isn't it it is the Del Boy factor it's also the heavyweight factor do you know what I mean but that's what sells storylines controversy violence that's what sells uh, just quickly, uh, Clarissa Shields put a tweet out saying that she could beat Jake Paul. She's going to put 100 grand on the table. This probably isn't going to happen, but put 100 grand on the table. They'll spar six rounds, and whoever wins more of the six rounds will take the 100 grand. Just from your perspective, right, because I saw a lot of fighters chirp into this, do you think Jake Paul could be competitive or beat Clarissa Shields? Yeah, I think Jake Paul will beat Clarissa Shields. Yeah, I mean, one, she's 154 pounds. He's 200 pounds. Is that Tommy Fury fight? You know, yeah. Um... But I still can't believe we're talking about this. It's bad enough talking about Tommy Fury against Jake Paul. But uh, yeah, I, I, I just think that he, I, you know he's not he's not terrible, but he's not very good. But he's two hundred pounds, big guy, and uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think a hundred thousand dollars is going to get that deal done anyway. So yeah, um, Keyshawn Davis signed with top rank. Obviously, you fought um, on one of your Canelo bills, and you had sort of some involvement with him. Um, I know loads of people to put offers on the table because he, you know, he's a snatch, he's a really talented fighter, young, personable, um, signed with top rank. Just sort of your perspective, I can imagine you sort of put an offer forward yeah, to Keyshawn. Yeah, we made an offer and we were made aware of top rank's offer. We got asked to match that and we just said no. It just, you, know, they, you have to put a value on a fighter um, and, and our value of someone might be a lot more than someone else's value. It's nothing to do with the ability of Keyshawn Davis. He's a tremendous fighter, really good guy as well. Just that it was a great offer from Top Rank, and in the end we said take it, um, and he took it. And you know I think Top Rank's also a good promotional company, and I think it's, it's a good partnership for him. And we look forward to signing him in a few years. <laughs> you had to, didn't you? You just had to, yeah, I like that one. Um, little giggle, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about. Oh yeah, Conor Ben was on Facetime to Amir Khan. Obviously, that was a point where. Um, I know Conor would have wanted to take that fight simply because I mean, he feels he can beat Amir Khan, which would have been massive for him. Still the Khan Brook thing going about, Brook's kind of a bit hesitant to talk about it the other day when we spoke to him. But um, yeah, what's the deal with Khan and Brook and potentially uh, the deal with Ben fighting maybe the winner? That's, yeah, the only fight I'm interested in is, is uh, Khan against Ben or Brook against Ben, but mainly Khan against Ben. You know, I've um, we spoke about Brook against uh, Khan. We withdrew our interest in that fight purely because I, I have to funk for Connor, And it was just, when you're putting your balls on the line financially for a fight, it has to be a fight that excites you. And years ago, I couldn't think of anything better than Kell Brook against Amir Khan, but I just know what it is now. And I, but with Connor, like he would fight Amir for nothing because he just wants that opportunity to be involved in a fight like that. And Connor Ben is a young stud, a young lion of British boxing. He's not 33, he's He's in his tw early 20s, right? And he's ready to fight anybody. Great fight with Algeria. He wants to fight 
Khan or he wants to fight Broner or he wants to fight all these guys next year. And I just feel that in terms of a crossroads fight, but Amir doesn't want to fight those young lions. I know, you know, he, he wants to, but he don't really want to fight. He, does, he doesn't really want to box. If you asked him honestly, do you want to go in the trenches and have a war? He doesn't need to. He don't want to fight boot tennis or Virgil Ortiz or these guys. Even Conor Ben, you, I've spoke to him about it. And he's like, oh. He wants to go and have a friendly one with Kel Brook. And he, listen, they'll both put it on the line, but it's not like back in the day, they hated each other, hated each other. And I was so desperate to make that fight. They don't even dislike each other anymore. And it's just for me, I don't believe it does the numbers that the money required to put down warrants. And I'm not prepared to put my nuts on the line for a fight that doesn't, just don't like, but, but, but with Amir against Ben, I just love it. I love it. But, you know, it is what it is. It's a really interesting dynamic with Connor, because obviously we've got the Algerian fight in Liverpool and Porter was a name mentioned alongside him. Porter's now fighting one of the pound for pound top five for, for the marbles at Welter. So like, it's, it's such a weird dynamic with Connor of where he is, because we know he'd fight Porter, we know he'd fight Crawford because he's, he's fighting a fighting geezer. But, but I said the start with the Avenesian thing. You know, people, oh, I can't be more honest with you. I feel like he needs another fight. Maybe two fights before he fights Porter, Avenesian, these kind of people. There's nothing wrong with that. He's a young pup, but he's so exciting. And the Algeria fight is a perfect fight. And it's a 50-50 fight, I'm telling you. But if he comes through it, then he's ready for Avenesian or see how Porter gets on. These are good fighters. There's no, there's no Terry Rush. We want him to fight for a world championship next year. He's going to fight in December. If he comes through that, he'll fight in February or March. Then he'll fight in the summer. And next year, I want him to fight for a world title. But this kid, he's golden. He's like, he's like the little diamond of British boxing right now. And we've got to get it right. And that's why Algeria is a perfect fight, because we'll see exactly where he's at. Virgil Ortiz and uh, David Avenesian is a really good fight as well that was spoke about at the convention. Good fight. You know, they're both really good fighters. I mean, um, David Avenesian got knocked out badly by um, Kavalowskis who Virgil Ortiz just beat. But I don't think Avenesian was at the races that day. Virgil Ortiz, I believe, fights at the end of January. And then I think he has to fight Avenesian after that. So it's a good fight. I don't, Virgil Ortiz, great fighter. Great fighter. You know, and Avenesian is a really good fighter. Strong, but he don't beat Virgil Ortiz in a million years. It's like you've got to move well. You've got to be clever. You've got to, you know, and yeah, I really rate Virgil Ortiz highly. Just quickly, one more, um, Joe Smith Jr. and Callum Johnson, looks like it will be a fight as well. Um, obviously, you've got a lot of like, heavy right. interest with, with Joshua Watsi and whatnot, but uh, yeah, it's another one that's a really good fight, actually. I'm just going to smash the shit out of each other, yeah. I think. Good fight. Um, we got offered that fight for Callum Smith about a month ago, and unfortunately, Callum's not in training. He's got a baby due in January, so we decided to pass on that. Um, and we actually put forward Craig Richards and Border Leak, who's our European champion, John Ryder as well, and they went with Callum Johnson, which I think is a good fight. And I'm pleased to see Callum get his shot. Um, it's actually taking place up in Turningstone, I think, which is where he beat Shawnee Monaghan a long time ago. And, um, you know, it's, it's a good fight. And hopefully Callum Johnson can get the win. Good, good win for a Brit on the road. And does that mean that we might see Callum Smith in with a winner mid next year then potentially? Yeah, look, Callum would have taken that fight if he was in camp and if he didn't have a baby due, um, but you know, it ended up giving Callum Johnson a shot, so he's probably quite happy about that as well because they're, they're former teammates. So, um, you know, you've got all those guys. Obviously, Boatsy's out now with an injury, but he'll be back in March. Callum Smith, Craig Richards, John Ryder probably moving up to light heavy. It's a, it's a brilliant division. You might have to get some of those guys fighting each other because you, they're not all going to get a shot at the world title, and, and some of those fights are big fights. Just finally, from me, have you spoke to Dillian on the phone at all? No, I spoke to his, uh, his team yesterday, I think. Just really, you know, those guys and their lawyers are dealing with the legal case, the arbitration, etc. So we just stand by and wait for the news. You know, WBO have already confirmed Dillian White is mandatory. It's just a case of when that's going to be ordered and when those negotiations will be ordered. And hopefully that's sooner rather than later.